So also tonight, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, we've been having these ongoing conversations. We've been having these ongoing issues and movements and people coming up about, you know, police brutality, police violence. I do have a guest that's going to be coming on in a few minutes, um, Nicole Westmoreland, uh, who's done a lot of research in this area. And she's going to come on and talk to us for a little bit about that. Um, just just, just earlier today or yesterday, uh, the city of New York settled with Akai Gurley's family. I believe it was for $4 million. The New York Housing Authority also settled for a smaller amount. And then um, Peter Lang, the officer who who was in, who did who shot him, um, I think he paid uh, twenty five thousand dollars out. Um, so that's something else that happened. And, and, and we look at these. I have a my caller is here, Nicole. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I am wonderful. So as I was just saying, everyone, I am being joined by Nicole Westmoreland. Um, she comes to me highly recommended. <laughs> Nicole, if you just want to introduce yourself to everyone and then just, just give us a little brief background on some of the research you've been doing. Okay. Well, first, thank you for having me on the show. It's an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Of course. My name is Nicole Westmoreland. I am currently a third year law student at Stetson University College of Law located in Tampa, Florida. And I am also a social justice concentration. So I have been doing extensive research on how to implement equality under the law within the criminal justice system. Nice, okay. Very cool. So you say you're a social justice major. Yeah. Uh, focus, concentration. That's pretty awesome. Um, Thank you. What? So, so with your research, so, so looking at ways to, you know, bring equality into the criminal justice system, what are some of the areas that you focused on? And then maybe what are some of the things that you have, you have, you would, you have found that are areas that need that focus, you know, maybe the most, if you were going to prioritize. Okay. So the first thing that you have to do is identify the problem. Once you identify right. the problem, you have to find solutions. Once you find solutions, you have to actually implement solutions. Right. So identifying the problem, statistics has proven that our criminal justice system is flawed from start to finish, uh, disproportionately against blacks, from traffic stops to searches, investigations, arrest, prosecutions, convictions, sentencing, and the preservation of life. Right. Now, it is hard to fix a whole bunch of problems at one time. So I chose to work on the inequality of the preservation of black lives first. The right to live okay. Is, okay. is arguably the most important right that you have. So it's headline news. has been headline news for the past few years on police killings of blacks. Now, police right. killing of blacks has been going on way before the last few years, but right now the unrest is at an all-time high. So next, you know, we've identified the problem. It's, it's no secret. Black lives are disproportionately being taken by police officers. So now we have to discuss and we have to find solutions. Now, we can tell blacks how to deal better with police. We can tell them to put their hands up higher or be respectful or more respectful. And all of these solutions could arguably be helpful. But usually in the criminal justice system, under the law, we do not first focus on what victims should do not to become victims. We focus right. on the assailant. Right, 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 exactly. Right. So, so several solutions have been suggested by several individuals, intelligent individuals. Let's do body cameras, more training, better hiring, practicing, counseling, etc. And all of these solutions, using a holistic approach, they may prove to be beneficial. But in our criminal justice system, the main solution that is implemented to deter and stop crime is punishment. Mm -hmm. If you are a criminal or if you commit a crime, you are punished. Certain acts, activity, is designated as a crime so that those acts can be punished. We've probably all heard the saying, right? You do the crime, you do the time. So if all mm -hmm. men are created equal under the law, 
then police officers should be no exception. Right, exactly. So, like, just just so, and looking at, like you said, I mean, this has been going on. I mean, we all know anecdotally this has been this has been a problem, really, since since we had the codification of police in the United States. When we look at, you know, the 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 the, the way they were used during slavery and post slavery, but as we we come more into this modern era, right? You know, post right. Let's just say post Rodney King. I mean, I, I know for most of us, for most of our age group, Rodney King, for a lot of us, if you're old enough to have remembered seeing on TV, was really like a, was such a glaring and blatant incident of, of, of police brutality that was caught on videotape. Right. And we've seen right. that continue like now over the past few years, like you were saying, we have these instances of not just police brutality, but police killings, police murdering of people at higher proportions based on race. Um Whereas even though we have that that proof, right, of what's happening, we still have that same, old, oh, I fear for my life. Even even when it's like, really, you fear for your life when they're running in the other direction. So you had to shoot them 17 times in the back or whatever ridiculous scenario arises. And we still see prosecutors like this. This is un this is. You never see this in any other scenario. You never see prosecutors who, like you just said, their job is to prosecute people. They're 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 responsible for 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 getting justice for the system, right? For the peak for the state. They represent the state. They represent whatever local body they're they're appointed by. But this is the one area where you see most prosecutors who bend over backwards to actually get defendants off. So what do you like like and what you've been looking at, especially being down there in Florida? So what kind of like have you seen if anything in like research or any of your thoughts or whatever about that relationship um, in the system? Well, well, let me back up. Let's talk about Milwaukee for a second, if we can, to, right. to talk about. Right. Right. So after the police killing of Mr. Smith, a 23-year-old black male, Sheriff David Clark gave a press conference. And that man in this press conference, conference <laughs> <Go ahead>. <laughs> <laughs> Sheriff Clark listed he was in the process of listing mr smith and the other male that was with mr smith he was listing their arrest record and he was not shy in voicing his opinion on what happens if you dismiss a case or you don't take individuals to trial or you don't punish them or severely punish them and mm -hmm. mr clark sheriff clark stated that by not doing this by not punishing that that tells individuals that's involved that not much is going to happen to them and then they tend to repeat the behavior. Yep. Sheriff Clark stated that's how the human behavior works. And his solution was to punish unwanted behavior. And he stated that if you do that, you'll see less of it. And if you do not punish, if you do nothing about unwanted behavior, then you will see a repeat and you'll see more of it. Well, Mr. Clark was stating those opinions and solutions and proposed solutions to individuals such as Mr. Smith. Right. But wouldn't the same hold true with police officers? If police I officers agree. are right, right, if police officers are not being prosecuted, if they're not being punished, then even according to Mr. Clark, that if an individual is not punished, that they're going to repeat that behavior and in fact you'll even see more of it. Well, and it just seems like if when when you accept like it's just like when you, like with children, right? If you let right. your kids say, well, I didn't mean to, even when it's very obvious, I mean, little kids get, little kids will do stuff sometimes on purpose just because they can't, because they're allowed to do it. And whether these cops, whether cops are shooting people or killing people on purpose or whether they're being reckless, whatever it actually is going on. But the point is like, if you're not, if there is no repercussion, because if all I have to do is say the magical words after the fact, oh, I feel for my life. If, if all that you have to do is remember one of those magical phrases, then everything's fine and you go on about your business. Like some of these people have so many different instance, incidences, multiple shootings on their jackets. And it's like, hey, no big. We'll just pay out. the We'll just pay out to the families or pay out whatever claims. And you're back on the street, you know, back pay, whatever. And it, it doesn't seem like there's any incentive for police officers to improve as a whole you know, in their behavior and in their conduct and interacting in, in many of these instances. Right. And, you know, they're not just police officers are not just not receiving criminal punishment. Like you just said, it's, right. it's, even in the civil aspect, even if the families get paid off, often it's not by the police officers. You know, his right. personal money has absolutely nothing to do with it. So if he's not being punished 
criminally, and he's not being punished civilly. And punishment is actually the bedrock of our criminal justice system. It's what has been chosen to stop and deter crime. Then what is that telling police officers? Well, we know what's happening. We, we know that we know two things is happening. We know that police officers are not being punished. We know that. Mm -hmm. And we know that police officers are continuing to kill and to shoot black individuals disproportionately to white. We know these two are simultaneously happening at the same time. So what would you say, what would you, what do you, so what do you say to people when they're, cause I know, so, cause in addition to doing your research and your work and looking at the you know, criminal justice system and how to address these issues within the system, um, you know, you've actually done, you, you do some organized activism, you know, in, uh, on the ground as well, not just purely academic, you know, research and writing. So what do you say to people when, when you, when, if and when you encounter them who are just like, well, they shouldn't have broken the law or well, you know, police police officers have a very complicated and hard time. Like, what what do you say to people in in those instances? And how do we, you know, get people to start thinking about this? Like you said, like how we think about everything else in the criminal justice system. Well, you know, police officers have a hard job. They do. Uh, I don't think many is denying that. At the same time, is that many individuals have a hard time doing whatever they are doing, like communities of poverty, right? So we don't allow, because if you live in poverty, then you can commit crime, right? And we'll be understanding that we, that that's not the synopsis of how most people think of it. So we can't say police officers have a hard job. So we have to be more understanding of them taking individuals life. Right. Right. So, you know, what I say to to individuals that, you know, state things like that is, yes, police officers do have a hard job, but everyone deserves to live. So that cannot be an excuse to be able to take someone's life. True. So and thinking about we've identified the problem, we've talked some about some of the issues and stuff. So what, if anything, do you see as suggestions or um, changes that people should actually be advocating for, right? Like, I know there's a lot of, there's a lot of movement towards looking at these national broader strategies, trying to get the federal government to step in. Um, Well, let me back up for a second. So I don't know if you've looked into this any, but have you looked at the difference of like, if we're looking at just regular state and local actors, you know, intervening and making changes in the, you know, or, or holding accountability versus the DOJ, you know, federal government stepped in because it seems like it's a it's a different standard, right? Like if the DOJ is going to do something, what they can actually do is rather limited in comparison to what state and local um, actors can actually do. Right. I mean, I think that is going to definitely be a holistic approach, right? So right. we need everyone's help. But I think that the community coming out the way so many of them have um, over the past few years with the headline news police killings is also a big help because it is applying pressure to individuals that have the ability and have the authority to make decisions to issue out punishment and arrest and uh, grand jury investigations, things of that nature. It is putting pressure on them and holding them accountable to their elected positions. So I think everything needs to needs to continue to happen, right? I hear a lot of individuals say, well, you know, you keep protesting and, and you're singing songs and you're standing in front of buildings, but you know, it, you have to change it through the law. You need to do more. Let's stop talking about it. Let's do something about it. Mm-hmm. No, you do all. Because you have to bring awareness, like we talked about identifying the problem, you have to bring awareness to even get individuals on board to fight for anything, right? And then you don't want to limit. Some people are going to be lawyers and politicians, and some people are going to to fight these inequalities through the legal ramifications that they have. But some people don't know how to do that. So, But they can still do something, right? So they can still stand there and hold that sign. They can still, you know, write out 
their feelings and, and present it. They, they still can do everything like that. They can talk. They can come together. They can sit down and, and have roundtable conversations, or they can sit down and have conversations amongst their community, right? So mm-hmm. I, don't, I think that it's a holistic approach, and I don't think anyone that is doing anything to stop this inequality, the preservation of life, should stop doing what they are doing. Very, I, I absolutely agree. Just want to let everybody know who's watching. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. This is The Way with Anoa. I have been joined by Nicole Westmoreland, who has done research and activism. She's a social justice concentration at uh, Stetson University College of Law. And we are just talking a little bit about strategies uh, to to basically bring about equality, equity within the criminal justice system and preservation of predominantly black lives. I mean, we, 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 we've seen other, I mean, it's not just black lives and, and we should not have to, I don't really even understand why we have to even do that caveat like that, right? Like we don't mean just black lives. We mean, I don't, I don't even understand why people get, get their backs up all about it. Like either you're about, you know, equity in the system or you're, you're going to sit there and complain that we're not talking about your specific issue. Um, but if you are trying to call in right now, um, this is a phone interview tonight. So uh, around about 840, if you still want to call in, you can definitely call in 678-810-0089. But just give us a few more minutes as we continue our conversation. And we'll definitely, um, you know, I, I, I would love to hear from you guys. Um, but so, Nicole, back to what you were just saying. Um, I absolutely agree about holistic approaches and, and really interacting with people. So. How have you seen, like, because you're basically, you're in both worlds, right? So you're, you've done, like, the community, you know, social justice activism world, and you're doing the legal thing, too. How do you see the opportunity to kind of bring those together? Um, do you see yourself maybe as a conduit between those two different groups, right? Because we have a lot of people who are passionate and who are in the community, but they don't necessarily have that legal expertise or understanding of different mechanisms within the system. Right. I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to, like you said, have the, you know, be able to be in both worlds, right? Because what law school does for me and has done for me is it actually helped equip me to really implement the change that we're seeking. Because a lot of us are passionate about it, but we don't exactly know what to do, right? So law school right. teaches you you know, what, can, what you can do on several different aspects from what you mm-hmm. can do with the government, what you can do legally, but also what you can do with freedom of speech, you know, what you can say, you know, that you have the right to speak exactly. on these issues. So law school is, is a wonderful experience and it really has equipped me and I appreciate it. I, I do want to say this a, a few minutes ago when we were talking about the holistic approach and I mentioned that everyone has, you can, you can, you can also protest and you can talk with your community and those things are helpful. And I said, so everything that everyone's doing is helpful. Let, let me talk about that because, you know, people change words around. So let's talk about the rioting because I know the rioting is what's happening in Milwaukee, right? So, mm-hmm. yes. Right. Now, I don't encourage or condone rioting and violence, but I do understand it. And it would right. be morally unresponsible for me or anyone else, I would argue, to focus, to not focus on why people are rioting. Right? right? So we can focus on they are rioting and they're wrong and violence is against the law and choose not to focus on the underlying opinion reason on why they are rioting. Mm-hmm. So, exactly. Right. Exactly. Very true. I mean, it just there's Brookings. I think it was what Brookings Institute report that showed Wisconsin is the most segregated. I'm not Wisconsin. Milwaukee is the most segregated city in America, um, followed by Chicago and New York, which are all northern cities. We always talk about the South being a certain way, but um, you know, two major. I mean, well, three major northern cities have extreme segregation, not just in housing, but of course, housing dictates often where you go to school. You know, proximity, right. your, your proximity to, to, to areas of income and employment, if they, those are even available. I mean, there's so much, you know, when we look at it. So I, I, you're absolutely like dead, dead on in terms of we have to dig deep and not just it's not just, oh, those people are doing that over there. It's historical context. I mean, you know, Milwaukee has been a democratically held control bastion for like 50 years now. And I mean, things have not progress at maybe the rates they, they ought to 
to help lift the community up. Right. And listen, when, you know, when a person's speaking to someone and that mm-hmm. person or people is not listening to them, what do many right. people do? They raise their voice. They speak louder to get individuals' attention. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King once stated, a riot is the language of the unheard. Mm -hmm. The black community is tired. They're tired of watching their community be killed by the police department. They're tired of police officers not being punished for the murders. They're they're tired. And many feel no one's listening because it's not stopping. Right, right. So, exactly. Yeah, I think we just need to and, take and, a minute. And a lot of people don't understand. People people are tired and it's not that just people are just sitting around waiting for a savior and you know, twiddling thumbs. You know, people will file complaints, people will try and organize and do what they're supposed to do. People we all you know, we've heard so much in the past few years about the conversation. Do you have the conversation with your parent with your kids? Did your parents have the conversation, you know, how to act around police and engage? I mean, there's so much that people actually do in our lives that is so different from what other people have to do in their lives. I right. mean, people are sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired. It's like something has to give and something is given, right? We, there is definitely something in the air right now and we need to mobilize and capitalize on it and, and keep it moving. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier about that it's sad that you even have to say Black Lives Matter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the issue is, is that individuals are saying black lives matter because of they're losing their lives disproportionately to whites. Right. So they're bringing yeah. awareness to lives that matter that are losing their lives. Right. That's not to say that someone else's life doesn't matter. Right. Right. Definitely. So, definitely. So tell me, so with your research and stuff, what do you hope to do and what are the next steps for you? Well, so um, like I mentioned, graduation is around the corner. I'm very happy for that. (laughs) Um, And I am going to, I'm going to do criminal law. I'm going to do criminal defense law. And I'm also going to do uh, civil rights litigation. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. So I, I definitely look forward to it. And, you know, change happens one person at a time. It definitely does. And we need more social justice warriors like you out there in the field making it happen. Absolutely. 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 Well, Nicole, I appreciate you so much. I hope this is the first of several conversations to come. Uh, I'm going to let some of these antsy people call in now. But I thank you so much for calling in and, and, and taking some time to discuss this issue with me because I mean, it helps provide a little bit of context and and we can definitely, you know, I'll definitely have you back on. We can definitely talk some more. And I'd love once you, you know, get your first piece published for you to come back on and talk about that as well. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Nicole. Appreciate you. Bye bye. Bye. All right, you guys, that was just Nicole Westmoreland. She is a third year at Stetson Law Schools um, and she with a social justice concentration. Um, we need more social, we need social justice warriors. I was just having a conversation with um, one, of my, one of my white brethren <laughs> the other day who, 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 who was, was basically explaining like, you know, being white, I feel like I don't want to take, you know, um, attention away by speaking out. We need social justice warriors across the board. We need folks who are willing to use their voice and stand up and speak out against inequality and lift up opportunities for equity and equality in the system, wherever that that may be.